Amen. Our passage this morning is in Luke chapter 14. And I'm going to be preaching from verse 25 through verse 35. But I'm going to begin near the end of this passage. Um, You know that I've been preaching um, messages that have to do with distinctiveness in the world. A Christian's distinction in the world. And by that distinction, we should be having an impact in the world for the kingdom's sake, for God's sake. That distinction really should be having this kind of an impact. But in verse 34, Jesus says, salt is good. Salt is good. Why? Because salt adds distinction. Uh, This Friday night, we were sharing a meal. Some of us were sharing a meal and fellowship and Bible study at our house. And uh, um, I was eating a piece of watermelon. And I was shaking salt onto this watermelon, and I got harassed. Because somebody, um, it really doesn't matter who it was, but it was Christina, somebody said, why would you be putting salt on something that's sweet? And Udai, which some of you maybe not know him, but he's uh, Susan's husband, he said, it's because of the contrast. So he kind of came to my defense there, and um, so everybody wouldn't think I was crazy, but it's because of the contrast. So we, as we are the salt of the earth, it is a good thing in the world. Why? Because it is a contrast. A contrast to what is worldly. A contrast to what is evil. A contrast to what is unjust. So that disciples, they themselves are the salt. It's not that they go out and shake salt around. It's the fact that they are in the world and they are the salt and they are a contrast to what is around them. Salt is good. We ourselves are the salt. And we're talking about being distinctive. We're talking about being a contrast to what we find around us in the world and that which is worldly out there. It's out there in the world where we are the salt. Now, um, you may have noticed over the last few weeks I've preached, uh, first of all, I've preached Christian distinctiveness, the blessedness of a Christian life, which... We looked at as being blessed is not in the way the world would measure blessedness, but turned upside down blessedness. You may have remembered that message. Last week I talked about light, and this week the salt. Now you can go to Matthew chapter 5, and there's a verse on the bottom of your front page of the bulletin out of Matthew 5 that talks about all three of those in succession, blessedness, salt, and light. But I've been taking my messages out of Luke because Jesus uses these these kinds of um, messages tied in with other teaching. And so you can go to Luke then and find um, these metaphors then applied to very specific things. So we're going to look at what it means to be salt. It's not enough just to say, go out there and be salt. We need to know what he's talking about. What does it mean to be salt in the world? What does it really mean? I'm going to begin um, just raising some concern in you with some research, which I do every once in a while. I've been doing more and more. Um, But this this is another book. I just got this yesterday that was written by George Barna, who, who does research and statistics, a lot of which he does for the church. And he writes, research shows that local churches have virtually no influence on our culture. The seven dominant spheres of influence are movies, music, television, books, the internet, law, and family. The second tier of influencers is comprised of entities such as schools, peers, newspapers, radio, and businesses. The local church appears among entities that have little or no influence on society. It seems that if we approach faith from a different angle, a church has little to lose and much to gain. I don't know how you measure that exactly. He does it statistically. 
uh, with a lot of surveys and such. And but even with that, I don't know how you could really measure it for sure. But I'm going to suggest to you the way to overcome that is for a disciple to understand what it is to be a disciple and really be a disciple out in the world and lead the rest to God. But you are not salt in the world if you are not a disciple. So we need to understand what it really means to be a disciple and go out there and be a disciple. And he says, you are the salt of the earth in Matthew. And just go out there and be the salt by being a disciple. And Jesus tells us here this morning then, in chapter 14 of Luke, verses, beginning at verse 25, how to be a disciple. And he puts it in the negative, actually, three times. He says, if you don't do this, you cannot be my disciple. So this morning we're going to look at three surprising ways that you cannot be Jesus' disciple. Three surprising ways that you cannot be Jesus' disciple. So obviously you guys turn this around from what he says um, to the positive to be his disciple. Beginning at verse 25 then. Now great multitudes accompanied him and turned and said to them, If anyone comes to me and does not hate his own father and mother and wife and children and brothers and sisters, yes, and even his own life, he cannot be my disciple. Well, that's kind of shocking at a first glance, maybe, that if you don't hate um, your father, your mother, your wife, your children, even your own life, you cannot be Jesus' disciple. Now, what does this mean? Coming from Jesus himself, who teaches and preaches over and over and over again that you have to love. You have to love one another. He's talking about disciples when he says things like that. You have to love your neighbor. You even have to love your enemy. Jesus preaches these things. So I'm going to explain to you uh, what Jesus is saying here. And I'm going to read just a verse out of Romans chapter 9 to give you what he, how to interpret this. And Paul here is quoting from Old Testament Malachi. In verse 13 he says, as it, uh, as it is written, Jacob I loved and Esau I hated. Do you think God hated Esau? And that's not the right way to interpret that, that he hated Esau. And as a matter of fact, the Jews, they did not have what we would call comparative adjectives. So when they wanted to show that someone was distinctly, distinctly set apart they would do it with a juxtaposition like this, to say, I love Jacob, but I hated Esau. And that was to show that Jacob was put in a favored position for the benefit of what God was doing for the world. That would show the extreme favored position that Jacob had for the benefit of the world, to show how far removed this position is. And that's what Jesus is saying right here, and I'm going to demonstrate this. Shelby, I need you to come up here, please. It's Father's Day, and this is my child, so we're going to do a Father's Day demonstration. Andrew, could you come up here and help us? I'm going to show you what it means. When Jesus says you have to hate your father, you have to hate your mother, your wife, your children, your brothers, your sisters, we're going to show you what he's talking about here. Now, because it's Father's Day, I'm going to talk about hate, how I'm going to hate Shelby, okay? She's the object of my hate right here. She's right here. And here's Andrew, he's, he's somebody's son, but, but today he's Jesus, okay? This is Jesus right here, just imagine that, all right? Now I'm going to give you some instructions, Andrew. No matter where I walk around here, I want you to position yourself so that you're between me and Shelby, okay? So just do that. Wherever I go, make sure that you're always between. <laughs> okay, you see this? This is how I hate my own daughter. You see that? Okay. Now, you can sit down now, now that we got the picture. This is how I hate my own daughter on Father's Day. And what Jesus is really saying, you have to love me more than anyone else. I have to love Jesus more than I love my own daughter. 
more than I love my own daughter. So that Jesus then is put in this elevated position for the benefit of the whole world. In the same way that Jacob was elevated to that position for the benefit of the whole world, that salvation would come, trickle down from him to Isaac, or from Abraham to Isaac, to Jacob, and all the way to Jesus. And Jesus now holds this favored position so that he is in between me and everything else. In between me and the people that you would say I have to love most. Because we can use that word most, and that's the way it says it in Matthew in this parallel account, is that we have to love Jesus more than everyone else. We must do that. And as a matter of fact, if that is not happening, then Shelby's getting rooked. Shelby's getting gypped. If I do not love Jesus more than her, if I do not at all times keep Jesus so close to me that he's between me and Shelby, that he's between myself and Tate, between myself and Melissa, that's the right way to hate them. Because now, with Jesus right in between us, close to me at all times, I'm looking through him to see Shelby. I'm seeing Shelby as Jesus sees her. I'm loving Shelby, not in my own imperfect way now, but I'm loving Shelby through Jesus Christ. So she would be getting rooked if I did not hate her in this way. And Jesus is saying, listen to this, this is absolute, it sounds so absolute to me. If you do not put Jesus first before your own family, before your own self-interest, he says here, even your own life. If he is not first before all things, it's as simple as this. If that is not true, you can not be his disciple. So let me tell you, if you're going out into the world this week, and this is not true, if he is not first before everyone else and everything else, if this is not true of you, you are not the salt. Because only disciples are the salt of the earth. And if you do not love him first, you cannot be his disciple. And do you know what that means? That means that his priorities are your priorities. That means the way he judges things is the way you judge things. That means that the way he loves, you love. That means that the way he shows compassion, you show compassion. That's what that means. Put him first before all else. And if you do not, you cannot be his disciple. The second surprising way that you cannot be his disciple. Verse 27. He says, Whoever does not bear his own cross and come after me cannot be my disciple. So you see, the only way you can be a disciple is if you pick up your cross. And if you do not pick up your cross and come after him, you cannot be his disciple. And if you are not his disciple, you are not the salt of the earth. Having that distinctiveness out in the world that draws people to Jesus. How do you do that? How do you pick up your cross? Now, I think this phrase gets misinterpreted sometimes. And people might say, oh, I have this terrible burden in my life. I guess that's my cross to bear. I have this sickness that I'm dealing with. I guess that's my cross to bear. Or this person treats me ill, so I guess that's my cross to bear. But that's not really what he's saying here. In chapter 9 of this same gospel, he says it a little more fully. He says in verse 23 of chapter 9, And he said to all, If any man would come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. And I think that is essentially how you interpret the meaning of taking up the cross. It is a self-denial. If you think about what the cross represents, it represents an execution. 
not just an execution, but shame, a shameful execution. So that Jesus himself bore the shame of the world as he hung on this awful, awful instrument of execution and was murdered there. So we pick up our cross. And it's a representation of our execution. And we ourselves die. Put to death self. Self is the victim of this execution. So that we deny ourselves for the sake of Christ. So that we do not live the life of self. We don't live the life of self-advancement. We don't live the life of self-agenda. We don't live a life of self-benefit because we execute self. And he says, do it daily. Every day you get out of bed and you pick up your cross, he says, and execute self. So that for that day, you do not live for your own agenda. But for that day, you live for Christ and His sake and the coming of the kingdom on earth. And I fear that we do not take this seriously enough, that that is what our lives are about in this age. It's about participating in the coming of the kingdom of God on earth. Are we concerned about that? Are we living our lives so that that is what is the most important thing for us? Or is it the most important thing for us to advance in this world's recognition of advancement? Is it more important for us to take material blessings to be used for our own benefit? Or is it more important that we are laying our self-agenda down, taking on shame in the world's view of things if necessary, and really being concerned with the coming of the kingdom on earth. Are we really doing that? If we are not doing that, if we are not executing self on a daily basis so that self continues to exert itself, we are not his disciples. Because he says, if you do not do this, you cannot be my disciple. It sounds pretty, pretty um, final, doesn't it? If you do not do it, you cannot be my disciple. And if we're out there in the world, living like the rest of this country, finding ways to elevate ourselves, finding ways to draw attention to ourselves, finding ways to secure ourselves for a worldly existence, before we're concerned about the coming of the kingdom of God in this place, we are not the salt. We simply are not the salt if we are no different than the rest of the world around us. The third instance here, he uses two parables, essentially, to present the question in two different ways. The first one is this, beginning at verse 28. For which of you, desiring to build a tower, does not first sit down and count the cost, whether he has enough to complete it? Otherwise, when he has laid a foundation and is not able to finish, all who see it begin to mock him, saying, This man began to build and was not able to finish. Now, when I was a child, my mom and dad had plans to build um, a nice house and um, a nice barn, and, and we we're going to move over to the farm property um, where my kids are going for the next couple of weeks. And um, they bought the blueprints, and my dad started building, and he decided he was going to build the barn first so he could have storage space while they were building the house. My dad's a carpenter, um, had these big plans. And he built the foundation for the barn, built the foundation wall up, and got a couple of sticks of framing up. And the interest rates there in the 80s just skyrocketed. So he had to stop. He had to stop. So for probably about 20 years, that barn foundation wall sat right there in the middle of a the field. 
So everyone driving down the road for 20 years could say, look, what in the world is that? They started building it and they never finished it. So when I lived there, I got a bulldozer and I pushed it over into the holler finally. But it's kind of embarrassing. And Jesus is saying, look, if you want to become a disciple, one of my disciples, give some thought to it. It's not something you start and then decide, eh, I'm tired of it. Reckon whether or not you're willing to go the distance. And when he says, count your resources to see if you have what it takes to get it. You know what I think the answer is to that? Do you have the resources to go the full distance? You know what I think the answer to that is? The answer, I think, is no. You do not have the resources without Jesus Christ to go the full distance. And the key is to begin with Jesus Christ, continue with Jesus Christ, and finish with Jesus Christ. And if self exerts itself along the way, you will not make the distance. So you might be asking yourself right now, am I willing to become a disciple of Jesus Christ? I'm afraid maybe I cannot make it the full distance. You might just tell yourself, you're right, you cannot make the full distance if you think the resources you have are enough. But you must start, continue, and finish the journey of following Jesus Christ in the presence of Jesus Christ who has the resources that you need. He asks another question, or says it another way. Or what king, going to encounter another king in war, will not sit down first and take counsel whether he is able with 10,000 to meet him who comes against him with 20,000? And if not, while the other is yet a great way off, he sends an embassy and asks terms of peace. So therefore, whoever of you does not renounce all that he has cannot be my disciple. So the picture here is there's a, there's a king with 10,000 men and there's a king with 20,000 men. Can he withstand him? Before you try to stand up against that king, you first must be honest with yourself. Is it going to be a slaughter? Or is there some hope some glimmer of a chance that you could actually beat him out. Well, the idea is here. No, you cannot. You might be thinking, I'm not going to start because I'm afraid I can't finish. But the question that needs to be asked here is, what's the alternative? What's the alternative? To try to stand before the living God on your own terms? or to stand before the living God on His terms. So here comes the king, and the only thing to be done is to bow down. The only hope is to submit. He says this is a renouncement. It's a giving over of those 10,000 men to the charge of the other king. It's a giving over of whatever was in your little pathetic kingdom to His use. It's an absolute submission so that whatever resources existed in your own pathetic little kingdom are now added to the kingdom of God. They are now given to His control. They are now given completely over for His use so that no longer can you say that anything that you have, whether it be money, property, family even, time, it no longer belongs to you. It's been renounced. You have bowed to the king. And you have given it all, given it all to him to be used as he sees fit. There's no other alternative, he's saying, because in the end, you'll find that that was the right thing to do. And if you have not renounced all and given all for his sake, to his glory, for the advancement of his kingdom, if you do not do that, you cannot be his disciple. So you see, here are three ways 
that we cannot be his disciple. We have to put him first. We have to deny our own selves, our own lives, our own agenda. We have to bow in submission, placing everything in his gracious care for his use. Or we cannot be his disciple. And if we are not truly his disciples, we are not salt. He says salt is good. But he also says, but what if salt has lost its taste? Salt is an important element in the lives of humanity. It adds that contrast, that flavor. It also preserves the world just like salt preserves food. And we go out there, and the world exists. We exist to be God's, to belong to Him, to be the salt in a world that needs it drastically. But what if it loses its savor, its taste? Shall its saltness be restored? It is fit neither for the land nor for the dunghill. Men, throw it away. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. Let's pray. Dearly Father, we want to be your disciples. Lord, show us the gravity of this truth you have given us. Show us what it means to give our lives completely to your cause, for your use, to make a difference in this world that you love. And I know, Lord, that you do not love the world because it's worldly, but you love the world that it might be drawn to you. Lord, let us be a part of that. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen.